morning, everyone, and welcome to the September 27th, uh, 2021 Tualatin City Council work session. Uh, tonight, we have a few things to discuss, leading off with our friends at Washington County. We're an introduction to the major streets, transportation- Recording in progress. Program, otherwise known as MSTEP. I just, there's Christina, I saw Stephen, and looks like uh, Chair Harrington is also joining us tonight. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hi, good evening. There's Aaron Wardell. There you, you popped up, Aaron. Great. Thank you. And uh, so I was just going to kick us off a little bit. I'm Stephen Roberts. I'm the Director of Land Use and Transportation for Washington County. And uh, tonight, the two real presenters are Christina Defebach. Chris is our Senior Policy Analyst for Land Use and Transportation, and Aaron Wardell is our Principal Planner. Chris is really uh, providing general oversight and guidance on the MSTIP funding allocation process that's, that we're here to talk about tonight. And then Aaron is really project managing the process for us. And I wanted to just thank you for giving us some time on your agenda tonight to come and tell you sort of what we're up to and uh, a little bit about the process that we'll be going through over the next year or so to allocate funding for this next round of our major streets transportation improvement program funding. And um, and I think maybe before we get started, I just wanted to find out, I don't know, Chair, did you want to add anything to the uh, intro before we get going? No, I'm just uh, here happily to hear feedback from the City Council. Uh, you all have been working very hard to improve transportation conditions within, to, and from Tualatin. Uh, unfortunately, my internet seems to be a little wonky this evening, so I'm just going to stay off of video, but know that I am here. Great. Thank you. And so, yeah, before I turn it over to Aaron and Chris, they'll walk through a little bit more of the detail, but I did want to just thank uh, our board uh, has expressed a strong commitment to the major streets transportation improvement program to continue it going, keeping the focus on our major streets. And uh, I want to thank uh, Mayor Bubanik and others uh, on the Washington County Coordinating Committee uh, who have also weighed in on this work plan that you'll that we'll be briefing you on tonight. So we very much appreciate all of the input and feedback that we've received so far and look forward to working with you as we move on to the next steps. And so with that, I think, Chris, you're going to start us off. Oh, you're muted, Chris. I'm, I'm rarely muted. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so thank you, um, Stephen, and I appreciate uh, Mayor and uh, Tualatin City Councilors to letting us come and speak to you tonight. And I, again, as uh, Stephen has said, just want to share the, um, the, 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 the high value we place on being able to work with you on the MISTIP process and the uh, strong um, commitment that we have in working with our cities in in uh, throughout this whole process. So for the agenda today, we're going to share just a little bit about the Major Streets Transportation Improvement Program background. As we know, um, not everyone has been around since 1986 when it was first formed, and so we we always want to make sure we go over the a little bit about the program. And then uh, we'll move into sharing our work plan for developing the, for allocating the funding for the, uh, for the Major Streets Transportation Program for the five years that we estimate for the revenue being between 23 and 28, uh, 2023 and 2028. And then we have some questions for you that, to get you thinking about getting your input on the outcomes that we'd like to achieve through this funding program and some of the um, questions about eligibility criteria for funding and the engagement process. So next slide. So one of the important things is to clarify where the step that we're in now fits into the overall process. It's a long process or journey to go from identifying a plan a project in a transportation system plan or after transportation plan. And that's that first step. Well, the step that we will be talking about now is to uh, figure out which of those projects that are on major streets transportation projects to fund 
with the revenue that we anticipate getting for the five years. And this is really all about keeping the pipeline going because we know that after we uh, dedicate funding, we have a whole nother step to go through in project design. And then finally we get to construction. So this is one step along uh, a long process for building the transportation system. Next. So a little bit about the overview of the MISTIP program. It is based on countywide, uh, dedicated to countywide property taxes for improving our major roads. And the um, our board has consistently and strongly supported dedicating uh, the funding for this program. It's designed as a pay-as-you-go approach. That's why we're looking at the funding, our uh, um, limits for the revenue that we anticipate being able to come in the door. And since 1986, when it was first uh, started, the, pro the program has funded more than 150 projects with more than $900 million. And the funding is allocated over five-year cycles. The projects are developed um, with a lot of public input and recommended by the Washington County Coordinating Committee to the Board of Commissioners. And I just want to say that the it's those 150 projects have done a lot for Washington County to keep up with the fast growth that this county has seen since this program was first started in 1986. And there you go. It was first approved as a series of uh, serial levies in 86, 89, and 95. And then in 97, the levy rate was reduced. It became part of the county's property tax rate. And since then, the county commissioners have approved for additional misstep cycles. And uh, we've they, they have been named creatively enough, misstep 3B, <laughs> C, D, and E. This one would be 3F. Uh, and this upcoming cycle will identify the funding for the projects and programs for the years uh, of the funding that we expect to get from 23 to 28. And this is an important point too, because it doesn't mean that all of the, the, the projects will be built in that time. It's really dedicating the projects that we anticipate uh, for that revenue. So the, in our last cycle, which was 3E, which uh, it, it uh, uh, dedicated revenue that we estimated to get between 2018 and 2023. For that cycle, the, the total allocation was 175 million, about 35 million a year in revenue that we estimated. That was divided up last time as 160 million for 23 multimodal projects. Seven and a half million was set aside in a special fund called an opportunity fund and this has been super helpful. It's leveraged about one to five or six dollars for every dollar spent. And this is the funding that's made available to for the cities and the county to seek uh, as match for competitive grant funds. Uh, there has been another seven million set aside for rural, rid, rural bridges, and then five hundred thousand dollars for intelligent transportation system improvements. And these have been used to leverage other regional funds for signal improvements across the county. Um, so as you can see here, um, there's uh, there have been projects over the years. This gold shows the uh, missed, completed misstep projects that have cut across the entire county. And the blue and uh, gray shows how uh, the improvements have been um, located in areas with uh, higher percentages of people of cover, color, limited English proficiency, and low income. And then in the Tualatin area, a few projects that you will recognize and know, including um, the Tualatin Sherwood Road and just a variety that have been developed within Tualatin and then an important feature of this program is that there are projects that may not be in Tualatin that benefit Tualatin like Roy Rogers Road. So there's um, through there. So with that, I'm going with that sort of introduction, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Aaron, who is going to walk through the specific um, steps. And then we have some questions for you. Thank you, Chris. My name is Erin Wardell. I'm the Principal Transportation Planner for Washington County. 
Uh, this slide talks about the four milestones that we have set up in accomplishing this work over about the next year. Our first milestone is where we are right now, which is confirming the work plan. Our board of commissioners approved the work plan at their meeting last week, and so we are getting to work on it now. We're also developing our equity framework and public engagement plan, and we'll be sharing that later this fall. In the winter, we'll be moving into community input around values and objectives for the MISTIP program identifying the eligibility criteria that we'll use to screen submitted projects, as well as the evaluation uh, metrics and criteria that we'll use. We will then be able to initiate project solicitation, which means there is an application process for cities and the county to submit projects um, for MISTIP funding. Our third milestone in spring and summer of 22 will be to actually do the evaluation of the projects that have been submitted and also to identify the programmatic elements that will be a part of the program. So Chris talked about the MISTIP Opportunity Fund as well as Rural Bridges and ITS funds. We will be going through a process to talk about those programs, make sure they're the right programs and the funding allocations are correct for them. Once we have the prioritized project list and the programmatic elements, we'll be going out for a big phase of public comment on those to hear from the community. And then we move into milestone four in the fall, which will be board adoption of the project list, the programmatic elements and updated administrative procedures. So we have a number of steps that go along the way. We'll be doing about monthly check-ins with the county coordinating committee and our board of commissioners. And sometimes those will be actions for approval as we move through this work plan. Oops, and I just jumped ahead too many slides. Uh, so this slide talks about the eligibility criteria. Um, in the past MISTIP cycles, we have used these as eligibility criteria for projects. They had to meet multimodal needs. They had to be located on roadways of countywide significance, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. They had to rank as a high local priority, meaning they'd been adopted into a plan and they were a project um, that the city or the county um, really wanted accomplished. And the program overall had to be geographically and financially balanced. Um, so this is what we've used for previous cycles. This is going to be one of our first decision points is, is this the right eligibility criteria to use this time around as well? So this slide shows the system of countywide interest map that we've used for that eligibility criteria previously. This map was intended to reflect all arterials in the county as well as collector roadways that carry uh, regional traffic. So we have the County Coordinating Committee's Transportation Advisory Committee meeting this week on Thursday, and it'll be an opportunity for city and county staff to take a closer look at this map and propose any amendments to it. We'll then take that back to the County Coordinating Committee and the Board of Commissioners to get a, a thumbs up and approval that this is the right map to use. So the proposed outcomes for the program, and this will be what we take out to the community for our first phase of outreach, um, are these uh, five different areas. Four of these come from the county's transportation system plan, and these are the definitions that are in the county's transportation system plan, and that's safety, economic vitality, livability, and natural environment. And then we've included equity as the first of the outcomes we'd like to see from the process. Part of this public engagement process will be to check in on the definitions of what these terms mean and work on making sure that they, they still work and that they still reflect the outcomes we'd like to see for the process. So a little bit more about our community engagement approach. We are hiring a consultant to act as a staff extension to help us do this work. We'll have these two big phases of community engagement. The first again is about um, asking the community what's important to you in the transportation system and that will inform the project outcomes. And then in the spring or summer, we'll be going out to ask people about the specific project list and react to that. We will be doing a targeted engagement with historically excluded communities. It's really important to us to be able to work through established committees and organizations and provide updates to city councils and other leadership boards as requested. We know that the cities um, have sometimes their own equity staff, their own equity committees, and have been doing a lot of work around this topic as well. And so we'd really like to be able to work with your existing staff and committees as much as possible. 
So with that, we have a list of questions here, um, but of course we're open to any other questions about the program as well. So our, our questions on the slide are, what are your priorities for the future MISTIP funding allocations? What are your thoughts on our proposed approach and outcomes? Do you have any feedback around the community engagement outline that we've, or approach that we've outlined? Uh, do you have any questions about the process? And then is there anyone else you recommend we check in with as we go through this first phase of the work? And with that, I will end the slideshow so we can see everybody's faces and take questions. Well, thank you. Uh, questions from the team from Washington County. We pretty big pop in. Councilor Pratt. Yeah, I'm having a little bit of a difficult time on the um, equity map. And what I'm wondering is, uh, I'm gonna name out the specific areas that I really think are of interest that I see are on your list or eligible, which is Boone's Ferry Road and Ellickson Road. But I don't know that they fall into this, um, a little, um, one of these equity things. So my question is, um, do you consider, like if you do a project that's outside of one of these blocks that's specifically targeted to equity, do you consider the people that will use that? Because um, I have a strong feeling that people um, in these um, equity areas would be using that road. So I'm wondering how you consider um, the people that are using it and where they're located, their original location is. That is a really great question. And that's something that we are working on just as, a, as an industry in general. It's, it's, it's one thing for us to map where we've identified communities who are people of color, low income or limited English proficiency. It's one thing to map where those people live, but it's really difficult sometimes to figure out what projects actually mean the most, right? So there could be a project that's not adjacent to where somebody lives, but it connects them to a job that they need to get to and they can benefit from that. So as a part of defining how we're going to be evaluating these projects and working with our equity engagement consultant, we'd like to be able to develop some way of um, connecting projects more closely to how it benefits the people who will be using it. So I don't have an answer for you right now, but know that that's something that's at the forefront of our mind and we'll be working on. Great, thank you. So Brooks. I just kind of want to piggyback on that because I think jobs are really important. And also when um, Councilor Pratt brings up Boone's Ferry, I know that there are one, two, three, at least three schools. So I think schools and kids um, are affected and that's something that, that I would be wanting to be concerned about and thinking about. Our schools and our hospitals are the things I'm thinking about right now. Um, and so that's just a little bit of, you know, like thinking through. And that's the other thing with equity too, is a lot of times kids are underrepresented because they don't really come to the table in the same way. And so giving extra thought to kids I know I'm probably not alone on this council when we think about kids in our community and older people as well. So those age um, issues. Um, and and that, that was just one little addition. There was one other thing I was gonna say and I forgot, so I might remember later and pipe back up. Thank you for your presentation. And one, piece to note on the schools is that we are developing a mapping tool that we'll use as a part of the project evaluation. And on top of that map, we're layering a number of different pieces of information. And one of those is the location of schools and then specifically the location of Title I schools, as well as locations of medical facilities. And so that is something that we will be trying to bring into the project evaluation. Um, and the map tool is really interesting. We'll be previewing it for the um, Transportation Advisory committee on Thursday and then sharing with the coordinating committee later on down the road when it's uh, more ready to be shared, but it's a pretty neat tool. Thank, thank you. I, th I remember my other one. It was, um, and so I think social service um, places as well. Um, and we have a hard time here getting those. So I kind of 
you know, it's a little challenging when we have a population size that's smaller. And then we have some really um, going into the equity piece. We also have this really, you guys know, being right next to the freeway, a lot of um, form function problems, like functionality issues, because there's so much that goes to the freeway and there's also so much um, migration for working um, every day, but those cut throughs and all that stuff when things get um, piled up on the freeway is, you know, directly affects Boone's Ferry. And, so, you know, so we get that extra um, traffic jam all the way from uh, east to west and north to south on our main arteries. So how does, I guess that's my question, if we have a smaller population and how can geographically, making sure that we're, there's geographical diversity as well as um, needs, diversity needs for individuals. That's for main thoroughfares, like being affected by I-5, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. I think I, um, you raised an excellent point and I, there, part of the program has been the idea of geographic equity. So trying to distribute the funds across the county because it is a countywide property tax. And so we want to ensure that the program's benefiting people who live in different parts of the county, right? And so, um, you know, and there are, like like you said, even uh, even though you're not one of the largest cities, um, you know, you certainly have some pretty major roadways that go through town uh, that need attention. So Twalton Sherwood, for instance, we're investing quite a bit of MSTIP funds to finally widen that last three lane section, which should help keep traffic flowing. Um, you know, in, in that section. Uh, and so, yeah, that, you know, part of, part of the consideration is sort of how do you balance geographically and also kind of with this program more so, more intentionally than we have in the past, thinking about uh, what equity means in terms of how the funding is distributed. Yeah, and, and I think too, with like main thoroughfares, there's, there would be, in my, my thinking, more people using it, so for equity, issues people from all different areas you know would be using mm -hmm. main thoroughfares like that so right. i think it would affect diverse groups of people even mm -hmm. though the population center might not be right where they live here right yeah okay thanks yep absolutely mm -hmm. all right yeah um thank you for the presentation very useful um and his the historical knowledge is really useful to me because I haven't been around since 1986. <laughs> so um, thank you. I my it's it's kind of like the same thing of equity and when the distribution of funds are happening. Um, and I think this is where Councillor Brooks. Uh, I I think this is what correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> It's not a lot of the if you're looking at location and saying okay maybe Tualatin has it income average of this, uh, it could be that the residents probably because, you know, they go and work outside to all of them, but the people that are coming, uh, like for instance, around Bridgeport, like the restaurants that are there, uh, the cooks, the, the, the people that are serving, the, the hospitality, all that, they're not always people that work uh, that live here in Tualatin. So if you're basing based on, oh, how many people live here uh, mm -hmm. and their income is this, but then um, let's not give them these funds because their income is this level. But there are businesses and um, in our area, business parks as well, like factories and manufact all these manufacturing companies that people, 90% of our people uh, from the businesses do, do not live here. So they travel here somehow. So I think that also should be taken in, a, in, in account as we're distributing funds, like where are these people working and where can we uh, have transportation that is easy for them, um, for, for those that are coming to work here in, in, that, in the industry 
that um, mm -hmm. is needed. So I feel like that's where um, I hope that that we're looking and taking into account all that in the equity eye lens and in the business. Yeah, thank you. That something that we definitely want to take a look at is location of um, service jobs, like what you're talking about. I had a meeting with the county's public health staff last week, and that was a point they raised as well as being an important um, criteria to look at. Other questions? Councillor Saka. Just to um, maybe expand a little bit on what Councillor Reyes was saying um, with the businesses is also taking into consideration the uh, attracting businesses with the availability to get uh, you know new businesses with an in Tualatin and their concerns with not locating here because of the difficulty getting around in Tualatin, especially Tualatin Sherwood Road and Boone's Ferry Road. And, you know, we're going to have some, um, you know, some development in that area and making sure, and I love those businesses, especially on 12th and Sherwood are going to be, um, you know, manufacturing and maybe some um, attracting some lower income um, employees and making sure them that's also looked at in this equity lens as far as attracting jobs for um, those people to support um, to support bringing those jobs here, um, and is it an attractive place if the um, if the system can't handle additional um, uh, additional traffic in those main Twelfth and Sherwood Boonesbury areas? Councilor Hillier. Thank you. I just wanted to be sure that in the equity lens and other um, considerations, we were thinking about people with othering needs and the wraparound services that they need to get to, um, really expanding on what everyone else has said about um, the in and out, north, south, east, and west of our community and the really the burden that it puts on the existing roads that we have today. And also things like services um, for our community members to ensure that things like, you know, we have only a municipal court here in Tualatin in order to get our residents to Beaverton or Hillsborough, you know, just, just really considering that in the equity lens of how do we provide services um, for people here in our community. So not only do businesses wanna be part of our community, but it enhances um, the experience of the people who live here in our community. And I also wanted to just um, touch on the fact of ensuring that there's safe ways for our students um, in, these, um, in the multimodal ways for students who are going straight to manufacturing jobs or to community college or whatever it is that are, you know, maybe are only at school part of the day or um, at a high school or, you know, parents who are dropping their kids off at a school and heading to those places in different um, modes of, of transportation. And I just wanted to ensure that those equity things, we have 2,000 students at our high school, 600 at each of the elementary schools near Boone's Ferry or 500 and some, and then, you know, we have Horizon. So just ensure that we're really thinking through um, those sorts of, I, I'm not sure if it's just equity or many, <laughs> many things to consider in, in what I'm thinking about. Yeah, and I think, Councillor, to your point, um, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking about, and, and some of the other comments that I've heard from other councillors, the just the interconnectedness of our system and our communities. I mean, we all are passing through our neighboring communities, or, you know, I live here, but I work there, but I'm passing through here. And I think even just the interconnectedness of, of the system in terms of how people move through the space. So we have people, obviously, in cars, we have people that are Try, uh, trying to use transit or relying on transit. And we have folks that may be trying to walk and cycle. And so it is a real challenge to try to think about all of those different um, uh, interdependencies, I guess, uh, you know, in the, tra in the transportation system. But I think, again, getting at the nature of this program, really with that emphasis on sort of the major streets and, and again, then how do we help move people on those streets, move people across those streets, move people that are riding transit, hopefully on some of those uh, roadways. So it's a, it's a complex dynamic trying to work through it. If I could just add one thing. I think one thing that's interesting is that your comments point to the kinds of evaluation measures that are that have been used in the past to evaluate these projects and what Aaron's team will be diving into to define 
uh, with with broader input, but things like safety and economic vitality to attract businesses, uh, access to services, uh, those are all things that have in, in the past been used to begin to rank these, these uh, projects. As we know we're gonna get way more requests than we have funding for. So this is something that you'll hear about more as we really try to articulate those um, in ways that people can understand how what factors are important to folks for um, setting the priorities? Other questions? Councilor Brooks. Sorry, I just have uh, two more. Um, one is we, we talked about public transportation and just to remember here, we do not have robust public transportation for some of the reasons where I think that some more concentrated places that have more diverse populations may have more robust public transportation, but here is very, very difficult. Um, so just in, in, and I think the mindfulness of that also dovetails on environmental justice and the fact that we don't have, that we, um, that people are disproportionately affected by pollution as well that are in those ways and that we don't have those kind of clean um, energy resources or transportation resources here. Um, those are two things that I think are really important to remember and to think about. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Councilor Reyes. Just one more. I know you said here, um, one of your questions, what are your priorities for future MSI, MSTIP funding allocations? I think that, um, I think I second whoever brought up the uh, Tualatin Sherwood Road. Um, I can't remember which of my fellow councilors brought it up, but I think um, that area just needs a lot of work. That that would be another priority of mine because, um, like like someone said, we do need these connections, and um, my priority is also the uh, making sure that people can get to help um, places like you know like clinics or um, whatever whether it's a free clinic down in by um, on Borland or any other hospitals around there. I think it's really important. That, that would be one of my priorities that people can have access to that. That's really important. Um, and also just just somehow that area, of toilet, when when you exit in that area, you're come, you have people coming from I-5, 205, um, just, just a whole bunch of mess <laughs> right there. So um, look at, I, I, would, I would, that's also another, I could say a priority of mine that I would look into, but definitely getting people easy, easy access to, to healthcare and, and area of services that they can take advantage of. Okay. Other questions? Nancy, I, got, I just got two comments. Uh, one is I'll pick on uh, 65th first. So 65th and Pacific Highway are both multi-jurisdictional uh, facilities. 65th and is, has become the unofficial bypass for I-5 mm -hmm. um, and is getting buried routinely. We also know it's where Marine Park Hospital is and one of our designated census tracts is right there at Falati mm -hmm. Park. So I would hope that one of the things also in the criteria are those routes that have become unofficial bypasses for I-5, uh, because that would also take into account Boone's Ferry Road, that those facilities in the event of a accident or anything, we all know to avoid those because they just get crushed. And 65th, especially now, um, when you come down 65th, when you're heading to I-5, it needs significant improvement. That bridge uh, needs to be expanded. That whole facility needs to be updated because uh, it's basically outgrown itself around the area between the hospital, apartments, and growth is just doesn't cut it anymore. And so, and you know, how would we work with uh, Clackamas County on that? And the second item is uh, 99W Pacific Highway, our favorite, <laughs> that, you know, it's a state facility. 
uh, but it impacts five cities around, you know, us and, you know, the five families as we call ourselves. And, you know, how do we work with ODOT on improving that? Because that also runs through some census tracts of lower income folks. And it's got some significant blight all the way down it. Hasn't been touched since the 70s. How do we work to fix that in conjunction with ODOT? Um, you know, and that has become a major thoroughfare between uh, folks from Yamhill County getting to watch, getting to work in Portland. You know the story. So uh, those are two routes in, in my mind. You know, I know the county's working on 12 and Short Road. I'm looking forward to the day those lanes open here sometime in the next year or two, maybe. Uh, but uh, part of the metrics have to be mentioned, you know, medical facilities, uh, lower income, lower disadvantaged people. Um, but you also have to factor in, in my mind, you know, those routes that get buried during traffic, um, you know, traffic accidents and stuff like that, because uh, one accident on I-5, basically all of Tualatin just comes to a halt because all the roads are being sucked up by folks using Waze and Google Maps, and there's, there's no alternatives to go north-south. My two cents. <laughs> Council President Grimes. Thank you. Um, I would like to say I concur with the majority of the comments that have been shared by my other counselors tonight. Thank you guys for the thoughtful input. And I think I don't want to belabor the point, but I do think when we talk about equity, I think it is important to note that some of the thoroughfares we've discussed tonight, Twelch and Sherwood Road, Boone's Ferry, as well as 65th, an enormous number of multifamily or um, dense population um, apartment buildings, um, affordable condominium buildings are also located on these thoroughfares. So to me, I mean, it's already difficult to raise your family if you're living on or very, very near a busy road when you talk about diversity and you talk about equity and you talk about quality of life. And then when you compound that by these major thoroughfares, especially the north-south ones with the impact from I-5, they're the most severely impacted when we have major traffic issues and getting the children that live there to and from school and to and from parks, it becomes extremely dangerous, not to mention the additional pollution that comes from the cars that are often either at a standstill or moving very, very slowly through the area because traffic is just gridlocked. And, you know, when I think about the idea of the equality of the people that live in our city to be able to enjoy the amenities and the health and the welfare, you know, it really bothers me that a lot of these very, very dense housing areas are on our worst traffic thoroughfares. And then I guess, um, in addition to that statement, because it's not really a question, I do have a question, which is when we talk about doing community outreach and um, community visioning and input around some of these problems, do you have a, um, a particular strategy for reaching out to some of these areas where we have um, opportunities for high density housing? Because in addition, and I apologize if someone mentioned this earlier, on Boone's Ferry, you know, we have a new development, housing development going in behind um, Horizon Christian. And then a little right in there, we have um, an affordable housing development going in there. So, I mean, I just, to me, these all feed together and are very interrelated. So I guess my question would be, do we have or can we create a public outreach strategy and try to get some of these diverse groups that we value their input, but they're, I think they're harder sometimes to bring to the table and get feedback from than, um, you know, a traditional homeowner living in a traditional neighborhood. And since they are genuinely the most impacted, I'd like to be able to have a special strategy to reach out, get their feedback in, you know, hear their concerns because you know, they live with this right in front of their face, you know, seven days a week. 
Well, thank you for that. That is exactly why we've hired an engagement consultant to help support us to do this work, because we know that um, traditionally we are better at reaching people, honestly, who are like us, people who are engaged, people who already know how to work through government processes, people who have access to computers and can participate in online open houses, um, people who know how to reach out to their elected officials. And it's really important to us to do a better job of reaching out to people who haven't been as engaged in the process before. So that's what we'll be working through with our consultant on board. We'll be developing an equity framework and an outreach strategy with them, and we'll have that ready um, probably early winter and ready to implement. And I, I would just add, uh, sorry, Councillor, I was just going to add to what Aaron just said, too. As a part of our technical work group, we're engaging folks from the county's housing uh, services department as well in the process, just trying to bring a different lens to our work as well. Okay. And so I know they'll have good connections with a lot of the affordable housing developers and affordable housing uh, operators in the community as well. So we'll certainly be engaging with them as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Brooks and Council Pratt. I just had one more um, thing about the feed about the feedback. I also, for us, we have a lot of our um, faith-based organizations that do a lot of social service works here just um to remember that and then um i think even with people that have been engaged with the county <clears throat> and gone to some of the meetings sometimes i don't know that they know that they feel that they've been heard so i'm also wondering and then if we're um having people that are less engaged traditionally I am really sensitive about them spending time and then not sure if they've been heard. Um, if things don't go 100% how we like it, which it's never going to go 100% how we like it. Um, so, but I think that it's really important that um, the feedback loop gets closed the back to the individuals that participate. I think that's a really important piece, especially in our area where I feel that um, there's a lot of people that are not always feeling like they we're just at the far end of the county. So I think a lot of times people don't feel like they've been heard. That is a really important piece is making sure that people are uh, fully engaged throughout the process. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can Council I Pratt I, goes I, first and then you, Councilor Oh, Rea. sorry. Yeah, sure. Oh, I. I, of course, want to express my support for all the projects around Tualatin, but um, I wanted to speak um, to what the mayor said about Highway 99, because um, that does, um, that's a mayor thoroughfare, and that doesn't just serve Tualatin. It serves all the cities around us, and um, it's a main thoroughfare that serves um, some low-income and um, other um, equity areas and it also um once you go into Multnomah County when that becomes Barber that's a main bike route into Portland and um that I don't know if any of you um I know Chair Harrington's a bike rider but if you try to bike on that part of 99 it's um it's um a big risk right now so that would be a a great main thoroughfare to make into a multimodal transportation route and improve the safety of for everybody. Councilor Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process and I think thankfully uh, Councilor Brooks brought it up a little bit. Yes, I am with her on that. I, I traditionally, a lot of the, the um, non-English speakers and maybe even English speakers, cause I didn't even know either. And I speak English. Um, they not don't understand the concept of what they're asking them or why they're asking them all these questions about transportation. It's you know, a lot of times it's not accustomed to do that in their countries to give feedback about um, how do you want your road to look like, or do you want this, you want that. And so I, I, I'm glad she brought it up because um, here's where we are. We are in two counties, Tualatin. So uh, what happens, a lot of our community, the people that live in, that utilize our, a lot of the like um, Washington County um, businesses live in the, actual Clackamas County. So, but in their minds, they're, they are Tualatin and they are Tualatin. And so I feel like 
that uh, sometimes the communication number one, it's not com it's not communicated well, uh, and letting them know this is feedback that we're getting, we want to gather from you. And if it's in if it's in Spanish or in their own language, that will be even much better. But explaining to them that um, we want their feedback, uh, that will be wonderful. And also that it it is a Washington County because a lot of times what they might think is, oh, but I give my feedback when nothing happened on my street. Well, that was not Washington County, that was Clackamas County. And so they're not seeing a change in the area that they're thinking about because in their minds is a different, they think it's Tualatin, but they're not thinking that we're divided into counties. So, because a lot of them may not own property, they just, they rent it. And so the person that knows what county you're from because we're paying property taxes are the, the owners of the property. So I think that's where, a clarification on that process would be good and on that they're because they're part of city of Tualatin I would like to include them even though they live on the other side of the and uh, they live on Clackamas County because they do have a lot of feedback and Fred Meyer and all the where they go and shop for food it's actually Washington County so I thought I'd bring that up so thanks thanks um uh Councilor Brooks for bringing it up because they just came to my for <laughs> forefront so yeah thank you Okay, last call for questions here. All right, well, thank you, Stephen, Aaron, and Chris for coming tonight, and Chair Harrington. Um, do you have any last words for us? Chair, I don't know if you wanna say something and... <laughs> well, I appreciate the city council uh, making and taking the time mm -hmm. to review the... Uh, work plan for this next five-year phase of significant investment of county taxpayer funds, $35 million a year over five years. Uh, we're, you know, as being a longtime resident here myself for 31 years, I know I am grateful that we approved the MISTIP 3 program uh, back in uh, the early 90s. Uh, it has improved transportation uh, conditions here in Washington County, though we have quite a backlog of them uh, to satisfy the visions that we have throughout the 13 cities here in Washington County. I appreciate your comments about where uh, services are provided, uh, the need for there to be a good public engagement strategy continued improvements with access and connectivity. Uh, and it can be hard to uh, see our community continue to grow and develop. Uh, you know, you're closer to it. You control the zoning uh, all of all the parts of your county and we don't at all, but we are definitely in the partnership uh, um, business working with you to make sure that everyone within Washington County is able to get where they need to go safely and comfortably. So thank you again for having the team plus me here. Uh, I really appreciate it. I haven't been able to make it to uh, very many of the city council presentations uh, and I was pleased to be able to join you this evening. Keep up the great work. You do really good work here on the city council and uh, I'll continue to try to keep working with you as will every one of our team. I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Roberts. You said very eloquently anything that I probably would have said anyway. So thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Great, great comments. Yep. Well, thanks again, all of you, for taking some time out of your evening tonight. We much appreciate the update, and we know we'll be in touch as this progresses through the project phases. Great. Have a great evening. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, so moving on to item number two tonight is the allocation of funds to outside agencies. Uh, who's going to be running the Excel spreadsheet on this one? This is the magic spreadsheet. There's Megan. <laughs> yes, that'll be me. <laughs> yeah. So remember last year we did this um, and through a series of Excel changes, we figured out how to allocate the money. 
Uh, so if uh, Megan, if you could pop up that fancy dancy Excel spreadsheet. And you'll recall it gives a history of what agencies were, uh, what they requested, what they actually, what they received, I should put this but what they requested, then what, what they received in the last two years. Uh, you can see this year we've had a couple of folks, agencies who did not request money as they did in the past. And traditionally, uh, where we started this, remember last year, is that the agencies that received money last year, uh, we kind of put in as a starting point uh, in the received column, what they got last year, just to see where we landed as far as uh, how much money could be allocated. Uh, so is everyone okay to start that way? So we'll go ahead and give that a shot. See how fast making can type. <laughs> All right, so based on that process, that leaves us $5,000 out of the 40,000. Um, so this, I just opened it to the floor to folks who, uh, you, know, you know, do you wanna make changes, shift money around? Uh, in your packet, you have applications from all the applicants. Um, very, they're all very worthy here in Tualatin. A lot of them provide terrific services here. Um, and we have a little bit more money to fund um, some places. We can give them additional dollars or, um, you know, if we have anybody new that interests somebody, just yell it on out because I can't see everybody. So just go ahead and yell. <laughs> you, I, can, um, I can see Kristen saying that's about it. And I can see Valerie's. I, I just had it. So um, was there a reason, um, and I didn't look at the specific application, but for Love Inc. for Tiger Twalton Sherwood, why they... Um, last year we didn't give them anything. And so uh, maybe that's an opportunity right there. I think last year we just ran out of money. Okay. And we looked at uh, who had the biggest impact on the city. Mm -hmm. I always try to focus on what's in our city and what's uh, first and then kind of move on a little bit after that. but. Because of you know they're here in our community, they're uh, I want our people to go and and have these take take advantage of these services that are already here for uh, for them. So that's that's what I focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Council Reyes, especially because so many of the social services are more sort of countywide, and so. Our people have to travel along, you know, quite a distance, usually, usually out west to receive services. Um, I mean, I would be really happy to give the Borland Free Clinic the full amount that they requested using some of that extra $5,000, because I think that that is a nice, worthy, up and coming, very local. Um, service that provides a lot of care to underserviced parts of our community. And I'd like to really show them some support because I think they'll do a lot of good work for our community, especially now that we can help with some public transportation out there. I see Council <laughs> Pratt's hands up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of time um, just based on what we talked about last year and one was Council Reyes's thought of um, what serves our community directly. And then um, there was talk about kind of, and I did that. I, I went, I looked at the percentage of the services they say they provide in, of what their, the funds will be used in Tualatin. And um, I got Meals on Wheels, Neighbors Nourishing Communities, Borland Free Clinic and Oregon Community Warehouse and the, um, Good. be a land trust and then I looked at the number of people they serve and um, 
boy twelton food pantry um and um let's see oregon community Fu uh warehouse um tiger twelton family resource center have the highest numbers and then i looked at i kind of broke it out so um like by the type of services they're providing to try to kind of be more equitable among the groups and i think that uh, um what you said councillor grimes about um Orland Free Clinic, they're a really um, great service for our community. So I would increase that to the amount they requested or 2,500. And then um, the other one I really think needs to be increased because we only have really one environmental one here is Colonial Land Trust. And, you know, we, um, if we if we give them like, oh, I put $4,000, that's only 10% of our total here for environmental causes. So that would be the other one I would really for here. Yeah, some were very specific to what they wanted the money for. So a lot of a lot of times, um, I mean, when I was reading through them, that's what I was I was looking at what specifically they were requesting certain funds. So it's not necessarily going toward their uh, towards their operations all the time. Sometimes it's going towards like to engage volunteers and like I know the Borland Free Clinic did that um, engage volunteers. Uh, because they're mostly like volunteer driven. Um, so I definitely agree with uh, Councillor Grimes to to up their their giving to about 2,500. Um, but yeah, I, I the other ones I was just looking about what they were asking us to to support um, specifically. I do like the land trust. I just really when I saw how many like what they do in our community, like specifically Tualatin. It was like very minimal. So I don't know if that's, that's, I mean, they used oh, the money to the county, I'm not the county to like Columbia or something. And then- No, the money goes 100% to our backyard habitat program in Tualatin. All the funds will go to Tualatin from that program that they received from us. Let's go, let's go ahead and put the 2,500 in Borland. So I'll say that leaves us with, 3,500. I'm with Valerie as far as increasing the backyard habitat program. We just saw um, they came and visited and explained about the program. The other thing that I really like is they're doing an equity lens as well. So a lot of the resources that are available that you used to have to sign up for now are free on their website. So anyone can sign up and learn more about it. But it was very interesting to me that there's, I forget, like, 250 native species and 150 of them are endangered right now in our area and i don't know um anyway this it's a it's an effective way they also can do um, programs with parks and community projects um and it looks like they are serving right now 35 households which then when you add people to it um would be a lot more than that so and we just have nothing for environment except for that one organization i would like to use it for our parks <laughs> i mean our, i don't know i'm just saying that when i look it's like 1.75 percent because the funding is to pay for visits site visits so it's like they did 1.7 percent um last year in Tualatin and so I'm just I'm just bringing that up but it's I don't I if, I like if you read the application all the funds of them will go to Tualatin yeah the application specific it's not the whole their whole funding is a lot bigger than the application they're putting towards us this is just to service our area of the service area uh, Councilor Sacco has her hand up. Um, so I, I have the application up. And so my question is then um, for the Columbia Land Trust. So they're saying that the funds, the $7,286 is to cover the cost of implementing the program within the city of Tualatin. So if we're giving them $1,500, are are they going to be able to implement this in Tualatin? Um, if we're 
if we're not giving them the full amount. And so if we only allocate, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, we give them the full amount because um, that's, not, that's not where my mind's going, but my, my issue is that if we, you know, give them this, this much smaller chunk, what are, the, what are they going to do with it if they need the 7,000 to implement the program? And I think that's what their application is stating. And so I don't know if someone's reading it differently than I am um, and can maybe shed some light. They, um, they, we, um, I listened to a presentation from them a couple weeks ago, and my understanding is, you know, it never covers the cost, like, because the application fee to do it is like $35 and they waive it if people can't afford it. So they have to get funds from other sources, and this is just part of what would help cover it. I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> um, one that I think we're kind of looking, especially when we just had this conversation about lack of services on this side of the county, is Family Promise. They have a significant waiting list right now of, I believe the latest I heard was 80 families need assistance through Family Promise. They are booked out to the walls. They have no space to put anybody right now. Um, so in my mind, you know, I would like to give them some additional dollars to uh, help their program get some more hotel vouchers, get some more space. Because remember, right now, all the housing, all the folks that are housing are in a hotel because uh, of COVID. And they've got all the rooms full, but they're doing casework. They're doing a lot of good work out there. And remember, it's a 12, 13 week program to get people back in the, you know, apartment houses that are, that are you know, single women who are homeless or families that are homeless and been out of their car. So, um, you know, I'd like to allocate some of that 3,000 that's left over to Family Promise because they're just busting hump out there, uh, you know, <laughs> down the end of Borland Road, uh, trying to get people uh, into stable housing. I'll back up the mayor on that. I love that idea. Yeah, I do too. So we got how much, Megan? Thirty five hundred. So what? Do we, how about people? I'm just going to throw this in. If you put uh, fifty five in for Family Promise and the other money into Columbia, the remainder. Yeah. How's that work for people? Oops, I'm. I like that. I can do that. I agree with you, Mayor, by the way. I think that they've been doing great work out there and um, that would have been something I would have brought up too. So appreciate you bringing it up. Sure. So is everybody okay with this? Can't see everybody. If you're not, just yell out. <laughs> I'm gonna kiss you four faces. So I, I guess because this is, this is uh, Cindy, um, yeah. I'm curious, um, if and um, I'm curious in the past, um, what has limited? I'm considering the Family Justice Center of Washington County or the Sexual Assault Resource Center, but more specifically, the Family Justice Center of Washington County. And I, um, and it's because of um, the coping that's been used during COVID and the increase of domestic violence. And I know I work with a group in our community even of survivors of domestic violence. And I just wonder, um, is there any appetite uh, to um, fund them anymore or is what they do from your experience over the years, this is a great amount and um, it's worked well. So kind of more of a question. Based, um the Family Justice Center, um, as you say, Cindy does terrific work. Um, and I know we're one of, not a lot of cities give them money. Um, Cause back in the day when they started up, um, they came around and was in the middle of a fund right, you know, fundraising uh, campaign. And we committed back then that we'd always give them about this kind of amount of money uh, because of what they do uh, for, uh, battered uh, spouses and uh, so they don't have to go to court, all the great things they do out there. 
Um, so, and we always, we've always, the, the discussion when I've been talking to them is, you know, anywhere between, you know, 4,500 to 6,000, they very much appreciate from a city our size. So. Thank you. Sasaka. Um, I'm just wondering if the, uh, going back to the, uh, the Love Inc and just the, the optics of giving a the filling at least some of every application except for one. And um, when I asked about this first, it was, you know, supporting things that specifically support Tualatin, but it looks like, I mean, it looks, they do. And also there's multiple um, other applications um, that support multiple areas and not just Tualatin. So I'm just wondering, I mean, if, if anything that, um, you know, the optics of supporting every single one except for one doesn't, might not look great. Um, and I don't wanna, you know, I don't want one, one organization to feel singled out um, as we give every single organization something and one organization nothing um, just kind of doesn't sit well with me unless there's a good reason that we exclude one. The only thing I'd say on that area, Christian or Councillor Sacco, is that, and it is hard because we have so many areas we're trying to cover here, and there's four organizations that I put under housing or helping with household needs, and they're one of them. And um, of the four, um, I would say Oregon Community, where they're all good. It's this is the hard part, <laughs> and that's where it gets difficult. And I don't know why. I think they just get dropped because they're all so important. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I would also just mention that they do employ people from the city of Tualatin as well at Love Inc. Taylor, you're on mute. You've been on mute. We have about a quarter of our funds already going to that like housing, household type services. So it's um, I think that's part of why that happened last year. I mean, if we'd like to give some a little bit of money to Love Bank, we could always. I'll pick up. Sorry, I'll pick up Columbia. You know, with the money we just allocated, if we took five hundred from Columbia Land Trust and five hundred from Family Promise, then they'd get at least a thousand. Uh, could we, if there's um, the, from the four organizations that are kind of doing the same thing, maybe if we could um, stick to, you know, we already have that much, that much fund, that dollar amount of funds allocated towards that um, particular um, area. Uh, I'm wondering maybe if instead of take, because I agree that, you know, um, the environmental piece is important and I don't necessarily then want to take from the environmental piece if there's already, you know, we already have a chunk of funds for this particular area. Uh, maybe we can stick with the funds we have for that particular area and then maybe give some of those to Love Inc. Um, I don't necessarily want to take, uh, cause we're only then have 3000 uh, for the environmental piece where, I mean, I agree with what everybody said before where you know, there and what Val just said, there are four um, area or four um, applications for that household needs area as well. So what would be your suggestions to take the money away from one of other organizations put it into Love Inc? What are the four organizations again, Valerie? Well, they provide the same similar things like Love Inc provides bus tickets, medical appointments, grocery store. And that's what they're asking for. So if, or isn't that what we have a, a, a food bank that can help with food. We have, um, what else do we have? Like promise, family promises helps with a lot of that thing, those things too. So I'm just wondering if we are just kind of taking a little bit just to kind of, I don't know. I mean, if, I'm not saying no, I really don't. Um, I think they all do good. All these nonprofits are worthy of supporting. Uh, just We just gotta make sure that we're not taking away from uh, like something that's in our city to give to Tualatin Sherwood 
and Tiger, three cities um, that are providing the same services that our uh, nonprofits here in our city are providing. So that's just my, I don't know if it makes sense, but that's just my thought. I had, um, they, yeah, they do, they do a lot of, the, of different things, but I had um, community action organization, family promise, and Oregon community warehouse in the same category. And then Tiger Twelve and um, family resource kind of overlaps with them also. So what if we just took like 250 from each of those and so it's not a huge, you know, not a huge chunk, um, but something um, that would add up to something of substance for Love Inc. And I'm not, and this is my first time going through this process. So if I'm way off, please tell me. Um, but again, I just, I just worry that excluding one application out of all just doesn't feel great. I don't think you're off. I think our concern is like if we're giving less than we did last year to another group, that becomes a problem too, maybe. Well, uh, my, my, what I was trying to say is like, you're okay, so there's a nonprofit here that provides already the services in our city, and we're going to take away money from them to give it to another nonprofit that they're probably also asking for at Sherwood, um, you know, for, I just don't want to like, take away from a nonprofit that's supporting 100% here um, to support another nonprofit that is doing not just, they're doing here, yes, to all attend, but they're also doing Sherwood, they're doing Tiger. So now, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like, it's like taking away from your own child to get, I don't know, I don't, I mean, I'm just trying to make sense of it. And there has been times I've been, I'm in this industry, so I have received Thank you for applying, but we don't have resources for everybody, although your case was great. I mean, we get letters like that all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I've been a nonprofit, I raise money. So I I get no's all the time. So it's not the first time that we would get a no or we say no to something. I mean, to me, the most obvious place to take it from would be Family Promise. And I think we just all agreed to that, that was my point. Give, to them. give them because they're overbooked and they're here in our community and they really. I, yeah. I agree with Council Reyes and um, I like the budget, how it looks right now. I feel, you know, I hear the concern about leaving one out, which I don't love, but, um, but we do have duplicating services located right here in Tualatin. So how you're. I guess because I'm too new, also new to the process, um, I would like to just um, reiterate that people come to services and nonprofit services in a whole lot of different ways. So just because a person, um, anyway, and so um, I would prefer to see us take 250 from each of them and, and give Love Inc. something also, um, but it could be just because I'm new. Yeah. That's the whole idea of the spreadsheet. So, uh, who are the four that you might want to take two fifty from? Because we can play with this. I guess what I just want to—I think it's important to understand that everybody might not know about Family Promise, and somehow they may have because um, one is maybe more of a Christian-based organization, and maybe that's how they learn about it. And so, I guess that's what I'm—I'm I'm just trying to say is that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we'll come to services in a different way. So I don't. Um, yeah. I think the four that I think it's a good idea to have a pot for a category, and and to navigate within that. I thought Councillor Sacco. I thought that was a great idea. Okay. Yeah, I have a I have a suggestion that we take five hundred from Borland Free Clinic and five hundred from Family Promise, even though that hurts, and that would give a thousand to Love Me. I actually was thinking more like community uh, community action organization. They get tons of government money and this would be just a drop in a bucket for them and they're not gonna whereas it might help love inc a, a little bit more than uh community action 
because they just see it as extra cash or whereas that works too yeah. yeah i mean that would give them 1500 if we pulled from all but i hate to pull from family promise when we all kind of yeah agree. that's why I, um, that's a big one <laughs> I would take from, from five, community take, action. If yeah, I, so it's like 500 from community action. You put the 500 on Love Inc. And then where's the other 500 coming from? It's either going to come from the Borland Free Clinic or from um, right. Oregon Community Warehouse, one of the two. Or what about? 250 from Borland and Family Promise. I'd be better with that. I feel like the yeah. um, free clinic needs every penny. Yeah, they can right free now clinic to really get so directly established. I don't even yeah, like they don't get any it. money from government or anywhere. They're straight out 100%. That's not true. Money. That's we do. They do. I know uh, there's a government? nonprofit in the community that applied. Um, uh, in partnership with Borland Free Clinic for ARPA dollars, and there will be do some dollars coming. Federal? ARPA dollars are federal, I believe, yes. Mm -hmm. So try the That's 250 good. from Borland and 250 from Family Promise. Yeah, I can live with that. Does that work for everybody? Going once, twice, sold. All right. There you go, Megan. All right. So I'm going to scroll back up. So we're now up to uh, council meeting agenda review, communications, and roundtable. So any questions on the consent agenda tonight? All right. I think uh, Council Reyes is up for the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Okay. <laughs> All right. And before we do the Council Roundtable, um, this question for Nicole. Uh, we all discussed the, that resolution for resident rights, the proclamation. Um, and I said I was going to uh, sponsor it, champion it, if you will. I think everyone's seen a copy of it. Uh, we just need to vote on, you know, allowing it to proceed through the process of our proclamation process. So is everybody okay with uh, declaring that proclamation for in October? So I, have, I see three, four. All right. So that uh, proclamation is approved, Nicole, for October. For the 11th, the next meeting? Yes. Okay, we'll add it. All right. Uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and start the council roundtable with Councilor Sacco. Mayor, can I interrupt for just a quick second? Sure. Um, just want to make sure that I'm following the, the proclamation you were just talking about. It's not this, I may, I may have missed the long term care residence rights month, or is that yes, the one you're talking about? Yep. Because we have it, at least the proclamation in here to come on the, the meeting tonight. To move it in tonight's meeting, um, or at least the proclamation in your packet shows it introdu introduced and adopted tonight. So, did you want to do it in the meeting tonight or push it off until the 11th? Uh, I, put on, I just pulled the packet down a little while ago. It's not on the agenda. No, but it's, it was added to your council <laughs> to this item in your work session to yeah. talk about as your group. And then you were looking to initially have it added to your meeting tonight. Um, oh, so okay, it wanna... October 11th is fine. They just wanted some time in October. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let's make sure I was clear. All right. Sure. All right. Uh, anything else? Done. Welcome, Don. <laughs> I figured I had to at least say something to you know, oh, make it look like you'll I was be, actually you'll doing something. You'll be plenty during the city council meeting. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and do our round robin here and we'll start off uh, with uh, Councillor Sacco. I don't have any communications this week. Thank you. All right. Councillor Hillier. No communications either, sir. Wow. <laughs> Councillor Pratt. No communications. 
I went to a meeting on the um, the group working on the um, Native and Indigenous people, uh, uh, the land of, I can't say it, the land acknowledgement for Indigenous people on the land. And um, we're, we're getting pretty far. I think we're coming in front of council next month. And um, I'm pretty impressed. We, we went from three pages down to a big paragraph. So <laughs> it was quite an accomplishment. Um, they went to um, the Twelton Sustainability Network, did have a great presentation about backyard habitats, which was really interesting. Um, and then I went to um, Clackamas County Climate Action Task Force um, meeting where we're getting down to um, things we could do in specific areas and working further on that. And we have this big board thing that to me right now is overwhelming. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they call it down and get to specific goals. And that's it. Thank you. Councilor Reyes. No communication. Okay. Councilor Brooks. You. Okay, I have, a, I have a few. Um, Tuesday the 14th, I was, I'm on the Energy, Environment, and National uh, Natural Resources Committee for the National League of City. And they're, just so you guys know, they're responsible for developing policy and leading the National League of Cities advocacy on infrastructure and sustainability and related issues. And some of the things that we work on is water infrastructure and quality, air quality, energy, climate change, solid and hazardous waste management, local food systems and public lands. And what we focused on was the um, policy and resolutions review. So we were able to, and we also got an infrastructure update from the federal conversation of the advocacy piece. Um, but the policy and resolutions, I will, I should get a copy of, I only have the draft copy so far, but I should get the formalized copies before the conference even happens mid um, October. I'm supposed to get at the end of this month, so we'll see. And when I get them, I will forward them along so that if anyone wants to know nationally what they're looking at for cities, towns, and villages focused on these areas that you can have it in your inbox. Um, the same day, I also went to the Basalt Creek Twelton Arts Advisory Committee meeting, which was a meeting between Parks, the Planning Commission, the Arts Advisory Committee, and the Youth Advisory mm -hmm. Committee. And there was a focus group based on um, with the uh, MIG consultants. And we went over the maps and the concept areas for Basalt Creek and people gave ideas of their preferences for the west, central, and east sections of the concept creek, which are the Basalt Creek concept plan for the parks, which um, they've broken down into those areas. And just a reminder that they will be doing another focus group uh, with business and work force um, coming up October 4th and that there is the survey if you guys want to fill it out or if you want to share with any of your constituents um, on the website. And then the 16th, I was at the PAB meeting. I forwarded the consolidated um, focus areas, the annual performance evaluation report. They call it CAPER for 2020 and it's a 2020 to 2024 plan. It's open for public comment for 15 days and then we passed it on the 16th. And um, I also on the 17th briefed with Rebecca Gleason about the October Water Consortium meeting, which where we will be going over the, um, we'll discuss and review the strategic plan. So that's coming up in October, and then and it'll be my first time chairing that. So I'm just a little nervous, but not that nervous. And then um, on the 21st was the 1210 Arts Advisory Committee. Um, and we went over the annual report, which you'll be seeing here in council coming up. We also put a call, just so you guys know, we put a call to artists out um, for the traffic box signal wrap, which is something that is, um, 
it's commissioned. So if you know anyone that is an artist and it doesn't have to be original work and can be permission for uh, a replication of something that's already been produced. Um, but that call to artist should be going up on our website um, and they can fill out the application. And we also discuss the work that Councilor Pratt brought up with the native lands and people's acknowledgement and also debrief the Tualatin, um, Viva Tualatin recap. And then we were also joined and I sent out an email by uh, Rosea Rashan, Rashan, and she's from the Tualatin Valley Creates. And I have a list of things um, she announced the Creative Youth Collaborative started, which sounds really cool. Arts Pass, which the membership is $25 to. Monthly networking events to meet like-minded arts lover people. Creative Cultural Coalition of Washington County grant applications are also open. And those websites um, are in your email. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me on any of those items. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council President Grimes. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody that next Wednesday, October 6th, is bike and walk to school day for children in our community. So we're going to have hundreds of kids, I hope, walking and biking to school that morning. So if everyone could just please be a little extra careful and a little extra patient. Um, and if you can volunteer and walk or bike your kids to school that morning. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, just four things for me. Um, I attended the Tualatin Historical Society auction on the 17th. It was very well attended. It was all outdoors, under tent, uh, social distancing, all that good stuff. I'm proud to report that the winner of lunch or dinner with the mayor auction item was our own Lois Martinazzi. <laughs> so I get this. Uh, she was pretty excited. So Lois Martinazzi and her uh, partner uh, will be joining me for lunch or dinner in the future. Looking forward to that. Uh, on the 22nd, the Westside Economic Alliance welcomed their new CEO, which is Gail Greenman. If I remember right, she's come from the Oregon Farm Bureau. She has taken the place of Pam Treese, who retired from running WEA and is now a full-time Washington County Commissioner. Um, the next item was the uh, Metro Mayor's Consortium was on the 23rd. We spent some uh, decent amount of time talking about the redistricting, and it looks like late breaking news this afternoon that redistricting was passed in Salem. It's done. Uh, so we, if everything goes the way it looks like, we're going to be in the new 6th Congressional District, um, which is it's a pretty big district uh, spanning from here down to Salem out to the coast. So it should be interesting to see how these lines uh, are put on the map. Um, we also talked about, I sent you an email with some letters of concern from other cities and organizations about uh, the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking from DLCD. Uh, people think they're being a little too aggressive and uh, the impact that this might have on cities ability to plan. Most cities are still trying to keep up with HB 2001, you know, the missing middle housing rules, and now the state's coming down the pipe with some more rules, and uh, there's not the bandwidth in the cities to deal with this right now. Uh, so when you get a chance, take a look at the, they're all just like one page letters. Uh, the reason we talked about it is because most, this isn't in on our radars. It just popped up, and most cities uh, haven't spent a lot of time looking at it, and it does have impact. So uh, we might want to circle back with uh, Sherilyn when she's back that maybe have a presentation on possible impacts to Tualatin. And then finally, uh, later that, that day at the Greater Portland Inc. Small Cities Consortium had a terrific presentation from the Clackamas County Workforce Partnership on childcare, the state of childcare in the Portland metro region. And she presented last year and it's eye-opening. It's even, of course, it's obviously worse now than it was a year ago with COVID, 
and the uh, lack of slots for affordable daycare and childcare and after school care in the Portland metro region. So when you get a chance, I shot you the PowerPoint with some numbers. There's only one, basically a 1% vacancy rate in the Washington County in childcare for you know, available spots. It's um, the problem they're having is, you know, one is funding to get a childcare facility, facility going. Second thing is finding qualified people. And of course, to find a qualified person, you have to be able to pay them well. Um, so there's a financial problem, there's uh, equity issues. So take a look at that PowerPoint. It's just a phenomenal quick synopsis of where we're at. And um, depending on your, how you view the president's um, building America better, building back America better, there's significant funding in his plan to fund childcare and daycare. Uh, so we'll see if this uh, happens over the next few months with Congress because it's a critical need. As was mentioned, you know, you can have, if you, you can't have economic development and have businesses succeed if their employees can't get daycare. It's a critical part. We have to have it. You can't have parents being distracted from work constantly, driving uh, back and forth for uh, their children if they don't have good care before school and after school. And that's all I have. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention was the uh, proclamation. Uh, Councilor Sacco is doing a domestic violence proclamation, correct? Okay. All right. Well, that's it. We got a little bit of time here. So we'll convene back at seven o'clock. We'll see you in about a half hour. Recording stopped.